Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast brought to you by Milo Tree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Blogger Genius Podcast. Today, I'm really excited to introduce my guest. Her, na- her name is Jennifer Priest. And she started, wow, like 15 years ago in the online space as a DIY blogger. She has been doing that for for this long. She's still doing it. And she has a digital marketing consulting firm. So we're going to talk about both of those sides of her business. So welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thanks so much. I'm really glad to be here. So, okay, we are trying to figure out when we met, but... We have been circling each other. We've been at a variety of conferences. Um, We definitely met at Vid Summit last year. uh, And we both believe in conferences, like going to conferences. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Conferences are like one of my favorite, favorite things to do. And why? Um, I think, you know, one of the things is we work from home. We're so alone. And so it's nice to go and see other people and interact and it's nice to put a face to the name. Like I've heard of Milo Tree for so many years and to be able to then go and like meet you in person and talk to you, it forms like there's nothing that can replace that face to face connection. Even if we're doing like Facebook lives, it's so different to actually interact with someone in person. So I love just the networking aspect of it. And then there's also the learning. Um, I, I so agree. And it's funny. It's exactly what you just said. As soon as you meet somebody in real life, it is like that friendship is so solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you feel like you're like absolutely friends and you're like, we literally talked for five minutes. <laughs> totally. But it's like, I would trust you with my child. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a friend that we've actually been friends online for two years. And a couple years ago, or we were friends online for two years before we met in person. And a couple years ago, we planned this retreat where like six of us, we were bloggers and artists, decided to go on this crazy trip to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And it was really fun. And when we met at a restaurant and then we we're going to carpool from the airport the rest of the way to uh, the the place where we were camping. And I was like, this is the first time we've actually met in person. And she's like, no way. And I'm like, yeah, because we've known each other online and through texting for two years. But, you know, that's one of the great things about doing conferences is you can meet these people in person. Yes. And there, I think it's a little bit kind of what you were talking about. We work alone at home. And there is something to meeting another online entrepreneur that you're you have this feeling of like, I understand your world. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anyone in my town who does anything remotely like what I do. I'd probably have to drive an hour to find someone local that would even understand like my family, my, my husband and my kids get it, but like my extended family, they're just like, uh, you do something on the internet. (laughs) Right. Right. I, 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 and so there is that sense of like, you know, what it's like to sit at your computer in your pajamas, you know, (laughs) working on something that needs to get done for tomorrow. Yep. Yep. Or getting up at five in the morning because you're like, my blog post is due today. I didn't finish it. Totally. Yes. Yeah. So I think there is that um, kindred spirit element to when you meet somebody in real life and you can say, hey, let's talk SEO. And you both know exactly what that means. That, and I think too, when you meet in person, the guard comes down. So we were talking earlier that we had, we had been to the Ad Thrive conference together. And while we were there, a blogger that I have known online for years, I have seen her at conferences, but we never really talked. We had a mutual friend. And so the three of us, we went out kind of adventuring in Austin and it was the most fun time. We started talking about family and our lives and I feel so connected to her and Mm -hmm it's like you you can't replicate that like it's it's the commonality that we have that kind of breaks down the barriers and then the conference gives us that opportunity to get those deeper connections that's not even about blogging anymore right right it's why i say like i trust people like i would trust you with my child (laughs) you know it's Uh like it's weird and there there is an intimacy to it definitely so okay let's hear your story because i don't know it (laughs) So it starts quite a long time ago. I've always been entrepreneurial. Like when I was nine years old, I had my first craft fair. I was selling earrings. 
Okay. Um, and I, I've always been crafty, always been entrepreneurial, always kind of a busy body. Um, I used to organize the kids in the neighborhood to like gather pot, uh, you know, cans and bottles to recycle. And then we would like amass the money together and go buy candy and stuff. I, I, I was always like an organizing kind of person. I love that. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, when I had my daughter, I started doing scrapbooking and I got a mail order kit and I got really into it. And I started teaching classes and I joined a direct sales company and the direct sales company kind of came at the time that I had just graduated from college. I had two bachelor's degrees and I could not find a job because the economy was really bad. Mm. And so I joined this direct selling company and I worked my way up the ranks. And within six months, I was like the number two consultant in California. No, wait, and what is a direct selling company? So it's, it's like, like Stampin' Up or Tupperware. It's multi-level okay. marketing. Yep. Yep. Yeah, where you're, you order from catalogs, you do parties in people's homes and that kind of thing. And so that was kind of my entry into it. And I started doing email marketing to promote that. So previous to that, my, my online experience was to get through college. I used to sell like my daughter's baby clothes and I would go and buy things and sell them on eBay for a markup. So we'd go to like estate sales or yard sales and find something really expensive and buy it for a good price and then resell it. And that's, a lot of how I got through college was, was doing my eBay business. Wow. So then I was doing this online thing with email marketing. Cause I was like, I don't know how to build a website. And so I did, I built that, um, online business with email and I was teaching at scrapbook stores. And meanwhile, I ended up getting a job working for the local County and I was doing grant writing, a mix of grant writing and contract management and, um, working with all of these different contractors who provided substance abuse services for the county. And I ended up losing my job. They were very crooked. And the day that they fired me was when they were being investigated by a grand jury and I was turning over records. And they're like, um, Ooh. you're gone. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, yeah, the intrigue. Okay. Yeah, the very shady. So I, I was devastated because I was going to school to get my master's and I, I thought that I would work in government for a long time and um I went to the scrapbook store. I tried to go to class because I had I was getting my master's. I tried to go to class. And my professor was like, you're a mess. You need to go home. And so I went to the scrapbook store because that's where my friends all hung out. And I had I had kind of taken a moratorium for from teaching because I was commuting really, really far. And um, I go in the scrapbook store and I'm like all teary eyed because I lost my job and it wounded my pride and stuff. And they're like, good, you can now teach cr classes here more often. And I was like, seriously? And so my husband's like, he ended up getting a promotion the next week. And I, cause I was making a lot of money doing what I was doing. And you know, his promotion didn't equal to what we were making before, but, um, I was, he's like, you know what, stay home, do your thing. Like go work this business. I know you're really passionate about it. And so that's what started it all. And that was back in like 2005. Wow. So, um, I started teaching at all these different scrapbook stores and still doing, some different direct selling companies and making kits and selling them and making things on eBay and selling them. And I had clients in like Kota de Kaza and Japan and they would just order stuff over and over and over. And then, um, I was at this one store in 2007 that was a pretty big scrapbook store in, in Southern California. And, uh, you know, I was telling people about my classes and email uh, in my emails and they were like, you know, we really would love to be able to share, this stuff, can you put, put it on a blog, like share your classes on a blog and then we can tell our friends or, you know, why aren't you on Facebook? And I'm one of those people that I very much was like a technophobe. And I was like, I don't need all that. I don't need a cell phone. I didn't have a cell phone forever. I didn't have texting forever, but if I needed it for my business, I learned it. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to get on Facebook. And so my intention with Facebook from day one was a business thing. And my intention with the blog from day one was to promote my offline business, which was selling these craft kits. Now that same year. Wait, are those, the, are those craft kits you were putting together or was this these companies? I was putting them together. So at that point I had transitioned over to ordering the supplies wholesale, you know, going down to the garment district in LA and sourcing all these like really unique things, making some of the supplies like die cutting paper and, and sewing little appliques and stuff like oh that. Oh gosh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And I would put these kits together in mass and not only teach my classes with them, but then I would sell them on Etsy. And so in 2007 
is when I learned about Etsy and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like eBay handmade. And so I, right. yeah, for me, that was my reference point. And so I also started promoting my Etsy business in my emails on Facebook. And where on, are you collecting on. these emails? So I was using constant contact. So I had, and I had a paper notebook that people would fill out because like at, at that at, time, like what? When you were teaching, you said, here, yeah. give me your email address. Yeah, I would have them fill out this paper notebook while I was teaching. Or like if I did a booth at a craft fair or scrapbook expo or whatever, I would have this little thing. You could sign up on my email list. And then I actually started making those and selling them to other people. And I would decorate wow. it for their business. <laughs> this wow. was like a whole racket. Um, and I would sell like the printable. Ver I'd be like, oh, I'll make it custom for your business. Like, yeah, I was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And so... I had a paper book and I remember this one time I was using constant contact at that time cause they were the gold standard. So one yeah. time constant contact was like, Hey, do you actually have that this person signed up? And, and they were like, we're getting a few spam reports. And so I sent them photos of my book, right. and the pages right. in him. We used to have to do that. I mean, can you believe that? We used to have to keep a paper record that they gave us their email address. Wow. Um, and so everything kind of evolved and in my circles, I started becoming the go-to person for blogging and, and social media advice because I was using it for my business. And in 2009, I booked my first corporate client. And so somebody where I managed their social media and for their company and, you know, posted the things and managed their design team and just did all of that stuff in the craft industry. And so from there, I've gained more and more knowledge because I'm, I'm like, I'm learning it for my business anyway. Right. Um, and gained more clients and then working on in social media on different client accounts. It's really eye opening to see like how different things can be, you know, between Ooh. a multi-million dollar company and my small little blog, but also to see the commonalities in there and the challenges that they still face. Like money is not the answer to everything. Scale is not the answer to everything. Um, and it's given me a lot of really interesting insights into how to work social media. Ooh, okay. So like what, what is the answer? Well, what are the no commonalities? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> to break it down, like as far as the commonalities, it's, that's, that's like more than a podcast. Okay. But, um, I think one of the things is the methodology that you have to use in looking at things. That's the same. So, okay you kind of have to approach it from this science, more of a scientific mindset where you're looking at the evidence, looking at the data, really analyzing it, doing, you know, some level of creativity. So you've got to have both sides of, of your brain working. So you look at, you look at the data and you're really good with analytics, but if you you can't think of creative ways to then get to your goal, you're not going to be successful. So okay. I do a lot of like studying the numbers, looking at what the platform is telling us based on like, how does our content behave? You know, what happens to it when we post something on Facebook and then what happens after that point, but also looking at stuff like the signals that they're saying in the news, you know, what does their press uh, room say? What is, what is on their blog? Like what is Pinterest posting on their engineering blog on medium that gives us signals as to where they're going and how the mm -hmm. algorithm is performing. And then I can take that information based on, and also based on my experience and the trends and say, okay, this kind of content's going to perform well. If we put the content out in this manner, based on all this evidence, I think it's going to perform well. And so every piece of content that we put out on social is an experiment. We're mm. trying to see like, okay, I've, I've hit, check these boxes that I think are going to make it work. Now let's see how it performs and then go back and reanalyze it. And so it's this continuous process of analysis and testing, analysis and testing. And I think that's where a lot of people get in trouble is we go to a conference or we take a course and we're like, awesome. This person gave me a checklist of all the stuff I got to do. Rainbows and unicorns are going to shoot out of the sky. I go home, I put it in place. Everything's amazing. And then tomorrow the algorithm changes. Hmm. And that stuff doesn't work because those are tactics. Those are steps. Those are tasks. Mm -hmm. And we're not learning how to think about the platform. Mm. And so that's, that's the major thing that I've learned through all of this is just thinking about the platform and realizing one, the algorithms are here to stay. 
because there's just a fire hose of information and they have to be there in order to give us a good experience on the platform. I mean, if I saw everything that my family members were posting on Facebook, I would oh. just delete it. Yeah. I would delete it because it's just too much. And so the algorithms have to be there. So we got to accept that they're there. But then the second thing is what it, really, what are the algorithms there to do? They're studying our behavior and then making rules that help them get the outcome that they want. Yep. So we can do the same thing. If we study the platform's behavior, we can yep. then make rules that get us the outcome we want. I think that is so powerful. In fact, the thing that I always say is like, so Pinterest is very valuable for Catch My Party. It drives a mm -hmm. ton of traffic. And I say, when Pinterest says something, I pay attention. Right? If they tell me, okay, we don't want these long pins anymore, and this is like, they come out and they say 600 by 900, it doesn't matter if I don't like that. <laughs> it does, I'm not yeah. going to second guess what they say. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not going to go, well, my long pins have worked so well. I know they're saying this, but like, I'm not going to listen to it. Oh my God, I'm going to be the first one listening to it. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, when you think of these companies, they don't do things flippantly. No. And so they're re there's this big, like, it's like this huge machine behind them that then it's almost like I think of like a big alligator, like they don't move that fast. They're kind of, or a dinosaur, it's like kind of moving so slow. And so everything they do is very deliberate. And there's meetings after meetings and focus groups and, you know, oh, and testing. And testing. They test everything yeah and so they're not they're not making those announcements because they just decided we're gonna make it hard for bloggers right and and but that right. is that is the thinking that is pervasive in many facebook groups with bloggers is this idea that the platforms are just out to get us yes why they don't care they, they just that is not their purpose like every single platform that's out there and i feel like pinterest is so good about being transparent about this they have a mission. You know, yeah. Pinterest's mission is to help people discover new ideas and go out into the world and try them. Mm -hmm. And so that's at the heart of everything that they're doing. So if they're saying that this needs to be a two to three ratio pin, we can go and say, okay, why is it that they're saying that? Because 80% of their users are on mobile yeah. and they look better on mobile. Have you tried to look at a giraffe pin on mobile? You can't see it. Right. You cannot see it. And so if that is what they think is going to help them get back to their mission to help people discover new ideas. Awesome. I'm going to help people discover my new ideas on their phone. And so I think that's the thing is like kind of a little bit of a mindset shift in how we think about these platforms. They are not out to get us. No. They absolutely know they need content creators to be on there putting stuff on there, whether it's Facebook or Pinterest or YouTube or whatever. Yep but they have a mission. And so as, if we accept that and we stop fighting it and just take the signals that they're giving us and, and then adjust our strategy to those signals, first, we can have an ever evolving strategy. So that saves us a lot of grief. But second, we're going to have more success because we're not wasting time. You know, and I, I, I hate to kind of sound like I'm on a soapbox, but we're not wasting time with stuff that doesn't make any sense. And that is somewhat, a level of immature thinking in our business to think that a platform is going to care about a blogger, even a 5 million a month view blogger to say, I'm going to make this change on this platform to make that blogger's life hard. That's I silly. love that. Yes. And again, you have to think that these platforms need to monetize. These are businesses. So you have to put yourself in the mindset of Pinterest or Facebook or Instagram, and they're trying to give the best experience they possibly can to their visitors. And they're all still free. Yes. You know, they're, they're not charging us and people are like, well, it's just pay to play. There are always outliers, always outliers, always people on the fringes that are all of a sudden they're going viral because they're doing something <laughs> that captures people's attention. They're doing something that works within the algorithm. And sometimes people don't have a plan. They just have some kind of magic touch. Yeah. But really a lot of the people have a plan. Like if you look at these guys, the Sharer brothers, they're, Ooh, 
two they're two college brothers they um decided we're going to start a youtube channel they're very methodical on how they did it they started it in january of 2017 by october of that year they had over a million subscribers wow you wow. can totally work the system to your favor yeah. and i think it takes a mindset shift of instead of seeing a, a difficulty a roadblock first looking at it as a challenge but then looking at it as an opportunity and absolutely i, I now, think would that's you, a differentiator would you say that pinterest is where you focus your time or where you are the biggest expert in so you know one of the things that's been a challenge um I had this discussion with Michael Stelzner from Social Media Examiner. Yep. And and this is something that I'm going to share this story because it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's also something that we need to think about in our businesses, especially as a lifestyle blogger, right? You asked me what kind of blogger. I'm like, ah, oh, say DIY because I'm doing stuff. We're kind of all over the place, right? We're, I do recipes. I, I fix my house. I make crafts. It's hard to communicate. Do you add travel? I travel, Clearly. Disney, I mean, let's just Mexican food. There's a lot of right. stuff in there, right? And so we're trying to be all things to all people. And so I, I was talking to Michael Stelzner because um, he was like, hey, you've kind of been on my radar for a while, but I didn't understand what you do. Hmm. And that was such like a heartbreaking, but also revealing moment because you can't be all things to all people. And so right. I think for us, when we're talking to people about what we do, if we can communicate like one thing that we're really solid on and say, and, and that could be like our entry point. And so I say I'm DIY and craft because that's something I'm really solid on mm -hmm. and I'm an entry and that's an entry point into my craft blog, but I have recipes on there too. And so as far as like the Pinterest thing, I'm really solid on Pinterest. I have a course on Pinterest that makes sense for people to understand and know, but it's not the only thing I do. I have a YouTube channel. I've had virals on Instagram this year. I doubled the size of an Instagram account within a couple months and hit well over the 10,000 mark with it. So I can do stuff on lots of social media platforms, but I needed something that made sense for people to understand that, okay, she gets Pinterest. That's something bloggers need. That's something that businesses need to get yep. traffic. And yep. so that's like my entry point, but it's not the only thing. And so something for any of us that are like lifestyle bloggers to think about is like, what is our entry point that we can get people mm. in? And then they can learn all this other stuff. Because if we just say, I can do everything at the beginning, there's nothing for people to attach to and they don't understand. I, I get that. When I was at Mom 2.0 this last year, I went to an Instagram talk and I forgot who was leading it, but she said this that I thought was really powerful, which you'll relate to. She said, lifestyle on Instagram is not a niche. <laughs> yeah, it's too hard. And on Instagram, you want to niche down. And so you, like just how you said, you know, Pinterest is kind of your entry, your entry way in. Like if you are a quote unquote lifestyle blogger, pick your lane and really dig deep in that lane. Maybe you do most, you know, more food than travel, or you like food better than travel, or you like travel better, than, like go so that somebody can see you and go, oh, travel. Well, and, and then you can add some food and stuff, but you do want to, in the world of the internet, it's so easy to get lost. And yeah. so do think, where could I, where's my comfort place? Where is my sweet spot? Yeah, and I think, you know, the idea too of having this one branded Instagram, I mean, I'm, I am up against this too. I have smart fun DIYs Instagram. It is slow. It is slow growing. And I know why that is. It's because you look at it and you're like, I don't know what this is about. And right. people in less than a fraction of a second are making that decision and assessment where I have other accounts that are niched way down yeah. and those are growing crazy. Like in yeah. the same time period of three months on Instagram, yeah. Smartphone DIY this summer grew a thousand followers. It has 29.1 thousand followers. So not a lot. It grew a thousand. In the same time period, I grew a niched account from 7,000 to 13,000. Right. right. And it, it has, let, but I mean, it's going to be more than smartphone DIY before the end of the year. <laughs> and it's because people look at it, they get it. They're either in yep. or they're out. Yeah, yeah. They don't yep. have to think hard. Their their lazy lizard brain is like, uh, 
I get it. I want it. I don't want it. And they're, then they're, you know, then they're in or they're out. Yep. And yep. there's nothing that says, and this is something I'm experimenting with. And I know other bloggers have experimented with this too. There's nothing that says that you can't take that and create other niche accounts. So if I am doing, let's say food crafts in Disney, why can't <laughs> I have three different niche accounts that yep. then interact with my lifestyle branded account and yep. I'm putting that content out in multiple places now. Like, and yep. this is more of an Instagram thing, but why can't you do that? And if you think of Pinterest, we have boards for different subtopics. You could treat Instagram like your boards too and have different subtopics. Now you need to be maintaining those. So it's there's a question of scale, right? You can't do it on 84 topics. But it's something to think about of how do I get people in the door and then I get them to follow my main account. Just like I'm using Pinterest to get people in the door, but I do all kinds of other stuff for companies. Right. And I would say for Catch My Party, guess what? If you go to our Instagram account, we're going to show you beautiful dessert table after beautiful dessert table. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we have over 150,000 followers. Yeah. Because either you like it or you don't. I like that. That's and totally it, it makes true. Sense. It makes sense to people. They have to understand it. You know, Walmart's confusing. It's big and huge and you don't know what they do. You go into Pier 1, you're like, decor. I got it. Yep. 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 And by the way, I get overwhelmed at Walmart. Right? Costco, the same thing. It like hurts me a little bit. Like, <laughs> oh, I have to figure out how to get my cereal and my motor oil. Like, it's too much. I go to Target and I only shop in one side of the store. I'm like, I'll shop in the grocery side for groceries. And then I'll make another trip to go get candles and notebooks. And like, it'll probably be a different trip to get clothes. Right. You know, because it's too much. Too much. As a blogger myself, I know that there is a lot asked of us. And sometimes it's too much. If you're trying to grow your traffic, then you definitely need to grow your Pinterest followers. There's a direct connection to active, engaged Pinterest followers and growth in traffic because those are the people who are gonna interact with your early pins and Pinterest is gonna show it to a larger audience. If you have not tried Milo Tree, head on over because we will help you effortlessly grow your followers. In fact, if you have a friend who's using Milo Tree, ask her or him or her what they think. Um, the best way we've grown our business is through word of mouth. And also, if you sign up, you get your first 30 days free, you get added to my newsletter. I send weekly emails sharing actual tactical tips, but also some ways to think about your business and manage the different I don't know, the different emotions, the different things that we struggle with as entrepreneurs. So again, head on over to milotree.com, sign up, install it on your site. If you have any difficulty, reach out to me at jillian at milotree.com. And now back to the show. So while we're talking about Pinterest, right before we recorded, uh, so this is October 5th when we're recording this, and two things I want to talk about with regards to Pinterest. One is hashtags mm -hmm. and one is communities which have just launched on Pinterest. And yeah. you, did, you have a Facebook group and I don't, which I saw you talking in. What is your Facebook group called? So in case people. It's called Smart Creative Social Community. Okay. Um, so not very original name. <laughs> no, but like great. And definitely join her Facebook group because I saw you in there and you were talking about communities and I was like, oh, and then you were going to be on the podcast. I was really psyched about that. Um, so, so one, definitely join, join your Facebook group. <laughs> Secondly, let's talk about hashtags and communities on October 5th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you've got to date it because like everything we know about social media today is a snapshot in time and it could change tomorrow. So that is the challenge, right? Um, so first let's talk about communities. Communities are relatively new. They talked about them, you know, Pinterest did like this kind of a town hall conference where they invited people up to their headquarters this summer and told them about all these things. And communities, communities was one of those things and luckily for us that didn't get to go, there were people who went, who came back and shared that information, like Elisa Meredith and Kate mm -hmm. All. 
um, you know, they shared a lot of that information, which is really nice. And so communities was one of those things. So we knew it was coming. We knew it was in beta testing. You could email and ask Pinterest to start a community. So now they've turned it on essentially. And so the gist of it is, it's like, I like to call it, if a Facebook group where you can talk and chit chat had a baby with a group board on Pinterest, it would be a community. <laughs> <laughs> so you can stick pins in there. They don't want it to be self-promotional. They don't want it to be like a, a group board where, you know, I feel like bloggers come in and they break things. So Ooh. Pinterest is like, hey, we started this new beautiful thing called a group board. You can collaborate. And their intention is something like my group board called Dream House, where my husband right. and I yes. and my daughter yes. are yes. putting stuff on there that we're like, oh, I like this window. Oh, I like this totally. thing. Yes. And bloggers okay. were like, hey, we can game the system. We're going to put 800 bloggers on here. We're just going to slam it with all our stuff and we're going to get like a ton of traffic. Yeah. And so Pinterest was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We wanted this like collaborative thing. Like what's going on here? And not yep. that bloggers are bad for breaking it. I think it's really good to push the boundaries of what something can do because Pinterest's answer to that is, oh, we still want this mission. We still have this thing that we want to do. We need to put that in a different package. And yes. so they didn't take group boards away, which is nice. So they've got communities and communities they are like, we don't want self-promotion. We want this to be a place where you can discuss things, where you can share things, where you can connect with one another over the Pinterest platform, over those visual search results within the Pinterest platform. And so if you think about it, it's something you're, the way you're going to manage, manage it should be a lot like a Facebook group. You need to nurture it. You need to curate the people that you're inviting to it. You need to go in there every day and check. And I started a community. I have been in there once in like three days. So I definitely need to make sure to make it a priority. And so I wouldn't start a community just because you're like, I want to snag the name or I want to snag that topic. I wouldn't start a community um, for that reason. I would start it because you genuinely want to be there, experiment with it, experience it, and build this additional community, additional resource for your people where you're going to be connecting because it's not about just dumping pins. It's more about let's talk about this thing. Right. So I started a Mila Tree Mastermind community and I kind of don't know what to do with it. Yeah, so, so you can start discussions in there. You can ask them questions. Um, you can share information. You can pin posts, which is basically like a sticky note. You can sticky note the post so it stays at the top. So, like, I made some guidelines for my community, and I put those at the top. Um, so, yeah, you can put pins in there, et cetera. But it's still pretty unclear. It's still pretty new. And I've I've heard some people being kind of skeptical of, like, well, we don't know if they're going to still have communities and there's glitches and um, – I don't, I don't know if it's useful, so I'm not going to be on it. And I think that's fine if people want to do that, but I think they're missing the boat. One of the great things about adopting something early on is that you learn it early on. Yeah, yeah. You learn and evolve with it over time. So it's the same thing as like kicking myself because I did not start that YouTube channel back in like 2010. Yes. And I started it a couple years later. It was harder and trying to start a YouTube channel now. I don't know how anyone would do it because it's so complicated and crowded. Yeah. And if you learn early on, you can navigate it. And as they add new buttons and new things and you're learning it incrementally as it, yes. as it evolves instead of it being yes. this really complicated thing. So the other thing is, you know, people that are skeptical going like, Oh, this is a dumb move and they should have made more research. Like I said before, it's this big, slow animal. And Pinterest has a reputation for doing things really slow compared to all the other social platforms. You know, P Facebook's motto is like, let's break stuff. Like right. that's literally their motto. Yeah. And Pinterest is like, we want everyone to have a good time. And so they're just <laughs> going really slow. And they're very like methodical and really intentional with everything they do. So if they think this is a good thing to do, it is worth paying attention to because they didn't make that decision lightly and it is an extremely expensive decision to make. It costs them a lot of money to do it. Yeah. Um, so what would you, what would you recommend for somebody? Like, let's say me. So I, I heard about it. I went on, I created my Milo Tree Master. I have a Milo Tree Mastermind Facebook group. If anybody out there wants to join, please find it and, you know, uh, and, sign up and whatever. Uh, 
And so what would you say now I've got, now I go, oh God, headache. I now have to have two groups that I have to manage. So what would you say to somebody like me or somebody out there? I would not start a community until you are ready to put the time in to nurture and grow it. Okay. I would just go and be in other people's communities and talk to them because you don't want people to join your community and have it be a ghost town. The yep. same with the Facebook group. You got this Okay, group. so people don't join my uh, Pinterest community <laughs> <laughs> until, well, until I'm ready. I'm yeah, listening to Jennifer. A couple pe- get a couple people who are active in your current Facebook group. If you have a thriving Facebook group, ask a couple people who are active in there and say, look, I've got this community. Would you guys like to come over and kind of help me keep it going? I don't have the time to be in there every day, but I would love for you guys to be like moderator types. And I don't know if that's a setting or if that's, if that's something that would be coming, but, but engage those other people to come over and help them bring their energy to your community. If it's something that you're like, I want to grow it, but literally the holidays are coming up. I cannot do this. Right. Um, Right. So that it's there, but you know, and know that if it's there and you're not using it, that it may, I don't know, it may be removed. It may just sit there and die. But I think at a minimum, joining other people's communities and being active in it is a good idea. Even if you're like, I'm not sure I need one, go be familiar with it. Yes. And get active with it. Yes. Um, Like get your feet wet, see what people are doing and copy best practices. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes something someone else is doing will spark an idea for you that's totally different, which is awesome. So go try that. Like there's no, there's no real rules right now other than the one thing that I would say to do is Pinterest has community guidelines, which has nothing to do with communities. It's the same word. It's not, these are the (laughs) guidelines for overall Pinterest, how they want you to do things. So just Google Pinterest community guidelines and they tell you what to do, what not to do, to be authentic, don't spam, don't incentivize right. people to like, uh, you know, artificially boost your numbers, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I would right. just read those and then just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you are doing things on your community to make sure that it fits in with what Pinterest wants on their platform as a whole. Got it. Great. I think that's all great advice. And we'll keep kind of checking in to see what happens. If people have great ideas about their own communities, please email me. Jillian at MiloTree.com. I'd love to hear what you're doing so that I can get Jennifer, you back on the podcast and we can talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That would be really fun. And this kind of leads into the hashtag thing. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So last year, hashtags, hashtags just had their one year birthday on Pinterest (laughs) recently. Last year, Pinterest turned on hashtags. And again, the naysayers were like, oh, that's dumb. Oh, it doesn't work. No one's going to use those. We should... And again, it's like for them to be able to turn that on, they had to pay a lot of developers to do it. They had to do a lot of research. And it makes sense. If we look at hashtags overall, and I've kind of become somewhat of an expert on hashtags. I also have a course on hashtags. Mm. Um, It was just serendipity that I had this membership where I provided research hashtags lists, hashtag lists to people last Mm. summer. And they were like, I was giving them these lists and then realizing they don't know what to do with these. So I was making a course and then Pinterest turned hashtags on. And so I had this captive audience that was like hungry for hashtag info. And I was like, okay, you guys, let's test it. And they were so awesome because they all jumped in and started testing it. And we found out a lot of really awesome stuff about hashtags. Wait, now first, when you were creating this course and and sending people lists of hashtags, was it all for Instagram? It was the list of hashtags were Instagram focused. And okay then I realized people didn't know how to use hashtags and got it. The basis of hashtags really is that it's a tool to index content. So if you remember to back when we had books, like there would be (laughs) like encyclopedias, you would have an index at the back and then you, it would say, okay, the banana shows on page 17, 21 and 842. Yes. Yes. And really that's what hashtags are for. Hashtags are an index, a way to index that content. So you put hashtag banana on something on a platform, you click the hashtag and now that thing shows up for people looking for that topic. Right. That functionality is the same everywhere from Instagram to Twitter, to YouTube, to everywhere, the hashtags. And that's the thing. Pinterest turned hashtags on last year. LinkedIn turned hashtags on two years ago. YouTube very silently rolled out hashtag functionality. There is a reason that these platforms feel that they need to make content easier for people to find. 
Yeah. And so not just this move by Pinterest as a signal that, hey, they've invested a lot of time, money, thinking, mental power, etc., to figure out if they should do this, but that all these platforms are doing it. Musically has hashtags now. So there's all these apps and platforms that are that are putting hashtag functionality in place. So and Instagram with stories. I mean, it's just it's just all over the place that we can use them. Yeah. Um, so it was like, okay, Pinterest, how do we use hashtags on there? Because it is different than how we use them on Instagram. And so my first thought, like we're trying to do hashtag searches and stuff and it wasn't chronological. Now hashtag searches on Pinterest are chronological. They still are missing things. So I would think of it a lot like in that way, a lot like Instagram. You search for the hashtags. You're not going to see everything in the results that's for that hashtag, but you're going to see the vast majority of stuff show up chronologically in real time. So that's the same as if you search a hashtag on Pinterest. But where it gets really interesting and where I feel like the power of hashtags is, and I have a free guide on how to do this on my site, you just get to it right from the front page of my site. And Uh, I'll add it in the show notes. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the real power is in keywords. So making hashtags out of your keywords, not not thinking about, okay, I'm putting this hashtag on here because somebody is literally going to type in hashtag cauliflower recipe. I'm putting this hashtag because I want my cauliflower recipe to show up in searches for cauliflower recipe, not as a hashtag. And so wait, say that again. (laughs) Yeah. It's a little complicated. So if you take a keyword and turn it into a hashtag, yes, that is like an additional signal to Pinterest. Yes. About the topic of your content. Yes. So if I want my content to show up for searches for like buffalo cauliflower recipe, I'm going to put those keywords in the description. I'm going to put those in the title of the blog post, etc. And also a new thing on Pinterest this month is you can edit the titles of your pins so that it's different from the metadata on your site. So I could, I could split test different titles with different keywords. Like there's some cool stuff. Um, so, so there's some really That's cool things. very cool. Yes. Yeah. So let's say that I'm giving all those signals to Pinterest, what the content is about, but the, the hashtag seems to be like this, like a jab, like a, like a double whammy of, Hey, if you don't know that this is about Buffalo cauliflower, here's hashtag Buffalo cauliflower, hashtag cauliflower recipe, like putting those hashtags on there is like this extra punch that really makes sure that Pinterest knows it's about that content. So no one out there is searching for hashtag Buffalo cauliflower recipe. They are searching for Buffalo cauliflower, cauliflower recipe, easy cauliflower, vegetarian cauliflower recipe. They're searching for those things. And so the hashtag is a way that that keyword, very specific hashtag is a way to make sure that that content shows up in Pinterest search for the keyword. And when you, talk to normal people like Pinterest says, and I've heard them say this at multiple conferences, they're like, use broad hashtags. So in that case of the Buffalo cauliflower, Pinterest would say, use hashtag recipe, use hashtag cauliflower, which cauliflower is probably a little more specific than they would go. And that will get you, if people are searching hashtags and they're searching these very basic ones, that'll get you in the chronological search for that. But if that recipe showed up, in a search for hashtag recipe alongside a blueberry right. pie. Exactly. Exactly. Who knows, who knows what they're looking for, right? Yep. Yep. So there's that, but there's also that every single like non marketer, non online business person that I talk to doesn't even know how to use hashtags. They think it's a joke that you say like hashtag funny or whatever. Yes. Yes. And yes. they don't know yes. that they're on Pinterest and they're definitely not searching for them. They're searching for best sangria recipe. That's what they're yeah. looking for. So um, that's how we were doing hashtags back in the beginning um, yes. with my group is we were like, let's hashtag keywords. Let's try different things. And we found that when you put the keyword as a hashtag, it shows up higher in the search. Now I don't have any, numbers that say it shows up higher in the search other than evidence that's somewhat anecdotal. Like I put my keywords as hashtags on a sponsored blog post two weeks before Thanksgiving and it was about Thanksgiving. So it should have bombed and it went viral. 
Huh. You know, so I put like, like there's those stories that we have for that. Um, but there's nothing that I have that says like, if you put hashtags in your pin, it's going to show up 20% higher in the search. Like I don't have that kind of data and my brain right. starts to hurt when I think about doing that. Um, right. I'm more from the angle of try it, test it, refine it, test it again. So would you then recommend the broad hashtag? If I'm doing, let's say, buffalo cauliflower recipe, would I do a hashtag of recipe like Pinterest is saying? Would I do cauliflower? Would I do cauliflower recipe? Would I do buffalo cauliflower? Hashtag buffalo cauliflower. Like how would you parse it out? I would brainstorm and also search on Pinterest, all of those things. First, I'd look at the keywords um, and then I would brainstorm my hashtags. And so those will usually be, usually be about 30 hashtags or so. And then um, I only want to put like five or six on a post. I mean, if I'm being like really aggressive, I'll put more. But you want to avoid the appearance of keyword stuffing. It's very easy to do. Um, but there have been some indications from people whose accounts have been suspended. Um, now, Pinterest hasn't come out and made a, a formal announcement about any of this, but there has been some indication that there was a level of keyword stuffing with hashtags and to where, you know, it's like 30 hashtags of like cauliflower, buffalo, cauliflower, cauliflower, buffalo. They don't mm -hmm. want that kind of thing. So right. um, I would take like the 30 that I have and then split them up and maybe sets of five. So I might have hashtag buffalo, cauliflower, hashtag recipe, hashtag vegetarian, hashtag keto as the hashtags on one post. And then the next post might be slightly different hashtags. Got it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's smart. So I'm still hitting all those hashtags, yep. but I'm not doing it in a spammy way. Yep. Yep. And again, think about it from Pinterest's point of view, which is they want the user experience to be good. They want those hashtags to help inform the searcher, not annoy the searcher. Yeah. And I mean, if we look at the hashtags, we are putting the hashtag to help people who are looking for that content, discover it. Yeah, That is straight up all we're trying to do. And so, um, there's another strategy that I use. I call it my fresh pin strategy. <laughs> okay. And so this is where I have more than one pin for a post. Yes. And, um, that's how I'm able to take that block of 30. Sometimes I have 50 hashtags and I am rearranging them and putting them on, lots and lots and lots of different pins and then putting them out over the course of time over the course of a year usually to see how they perform and i've been doing this strategy since february and again i say pay attention to those signals that the platform tells you pinterest engineering blog while it will make you go cross-eyed because you're like oh my gosh they're talking about ux and ui and also i don't know what all this stuff is it gives you all these amazing signals about what the heck they are doing it's awesome so mm. back in February, they started talking about a new AI artificial intelligence they were using to read images and to read posts and help uh, Pinterest generate fresh content based on like the other content you've looked at, et cetera. And so this topic of fresh has come up multiple times when I've seen Pinterest talking on Facebook lives or at conferences or in some of their announcements and documentation. And I think it's coming from there was a while there on Pinterest where you would go and your home feed would have the same pins yes. over and over. They were the same, like most popular pins, but you're like, dude, I already seen that cleaning hack like six times. The yes. house is clean. Like, so yes. people yes. were annoyed. And so I think this is a response to that because now when you go to your feed, it is different every single time and vastly yes. different. I'll be like, wait, I saw that pin. I wanted to pin and I didn't pin it. Like, you know, and so it's like, it's vastly different. Um, and so how can we capitalize on that? Because we have the same old content from four years ago that's still amazing, good content. I've updated it. I've done all this stuff. How can I keep that going? Well, you need fresh content. So fresh is new, but fresh could also be maybe new graphics, maybe new descriptions, maybe new hashtags, maybe new And are you then putting these new images in the post or nope. you separately upload let's say you do a post on January 20th <laughs> and then like you've created some images and you'd you'd post one image let's say in January and then you wait two months and then you're going to post another image 
but is that image already living in the post or are you adding it separately? No, so what we're doing is we're taking what we think is going to be the best performer and we're putting that okay. at the bottom of the post. And then okay. um, we're putting the rest of the pins out through Tailwind or through Pinterest and then through Tailwind because there's a little bit of a strategy there. Um, and then I'm, pu I'm putting them out at a different frequency. So I'm usually doing But you're like, uploading them directly to either yeah. Tailwind or Pinterest. Yeah, yeah. And then we do split testing and paying attention to how is this performing because if something rises to the top, that will now become the image on my blog post because if this one image is driving more traffic, I'm yeah. going to put that. I want other people painting that too. So you're going to put that at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I don't do this for like every single post. I'm not watching 500 posts and going, oh, okay, post 499, we got to change the pin. I'm just looking at the cream of the crop at the top. Great. Yep. Yep. And again, remember, like the 80-20 rule, which is this idea that you can chop up things in terms of it usually takes... 80% of the, it takes 20% of the effort to go 80% of the way. And then it takes the last 80% of the effort to do that last 20%. But it works in all these different scenarios. So most of your traffic, 80% of your traffic is coming from say 20% of your pins mm -hmm. or 20% of your blog posts. So you want to take the cream of the crop and you want to optimize the hell out of that. And you do not want to optimize the hell out of the stuff at the bottom that's not really driving any traffic because you're not getting any value from that. But you are getting a ton of value from the stuff at the top. Well, and then you also can use those signals, right? So like what content do people want from me? They're telling me. Like, and the yep. same, not just yep. on my blog, but on my YouTube channel. They're like, yep. hey, lady, we don't want your recipes at all. Only 40 of us watched it. <laughs> but if you put up a craft room tour, tens of thousands of people will watch that. Right. And I don't want to listen to their signal. I'm still making recipe videos. <laughs> right. That's funny. That's funny. Okay. And why are you not listening to their signal? Because sponsors that want me to make oh. recipes. So if they're going to keep paying me money and, and you know what, I've thought about taking those recipe videos and slowly moving them over to a recipe only channel, which yeah. I have enough content that I could probably do that for a new video every week for two years and not run out of anything. Um, and seeing if it performs better. Cause again, niching it down, they don't understand what smartphone DIY is about on YouTube cause it's all over the place. Right. That's so yeah. interesting. How much of your time are you splitting between Smart Fund DIY and then also your consulting slash, you know, uh, social media management company? So um, <clears throat> for Smart Fund DIY, if I have a sponsored post, I'm probably spending like maybe 10 hours on the, the blog a month. Um, if I don't have any sponsored posts that month, usually I do have one, but if I don't have any, I'm literally working on it like three hours, maybe four hours. Um, I do have a VA. She does a lot of submission stuff for me. Really what I'm focused on this year with that site isn't so much making new content, but really dialing in on my SEO and, you know, making those, those fresh pins and making sure that the content when they get from Pinterest to my site is valuable and, you know, there's some meat to it, um, and that it's going to give them some good information. So I have, you know, there's, I'm always up for trying like crazy stuff. So there are some low quality posts on my site that, you know, I was trying something out and it just is not a good experience for people when they get there. So I'm, I'm really working on fixing that stuff, but smartphone DIY literally is a part time, part, part, part time gig compared to what I'm doing at smart creative social. So I've got two courses there, a membership. I have uh, corporate clients where I do strategy for. So I do have one client I'm still doing management for, but um, I, that is a service I phased out. So I only do strategy consulting because I'm not here enough to do management. You know, management, you need yeah. someone that's available 24 seven or has staff available 24 seven, you know, so they can email you on Friday of a holiday weekend and be like, I need these 50 pins up now and you can do it. And I just, yep. I yep. don't, that lifestyle was super fun. And I know people that like love it. It was super fun for the years that I did it, but I'm like, I'm retiring from management. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like I, I can't do that service well. And there's a lot of people who can, but what I do well is strategy. And so I also have some coaching clients. I have group coaching and that kind of thing that I do 
um, where it's not just social media. I mean, there's so much stuff that we know these interlocking pieces and that's more what I do in those areas. And that is more than 40 hours a week. Um, just because I really like it. I have a lot of fun, you know, I'll be on the phone with clients at night or, you know, especially if it's a coaching situation or doing group calls with my course people. And that part is super duper fun. So I love that. So Jennifer, if people want to reach out to you, see what you're doing, what is the best way to do that? Um, they can go to smartcreativesocial.com and you can get to everything from there or hit me up on like Instagram. If you go to smart fun DIY on Instagram, um, let me say it slower, smart fun DIY on Instagram. Great. Um, you can message me anywhere. Like if you find me on Facebook or, or anywhere, you can message me and um, that Facebook group that you had talked about, I would love yeah, if love you guys it. joined that. And yeah, I mean, I'm pretty easy to find. (laughs) I love it. Okay, well, Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope to run into you at a conference this in 2019. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for having me on. It's been so much fun. I totally love dishing about this stuff. If you're enjoying the Blogger Genius podcast, please do me a favor. Head on over to iTunes and rate us or write us a review or both. I would so appreciate it. Okay, until next week. Uh